today we begin our exploration of what it takes to experience peace within ourselves and what it takes to create peace in the world. And to help us in this exploration, we are, um, we're going to pull from this wisdom. The Arbinger Institute has uh, published this book called The Anatomy of Peace. The Anatomy of Peace, we're using this for our inspiration. Since we are Unity Center of Peace, <laughs> I thought maybe that would be a good fit. <laughs> So um, the book is really set in uh, this kind of fictional story uh, that about two men, an Israeli and a Palestinian, who we find out a little later have every reason to hate each other. Uh, and instead, they decide to come together and work through it and to resolve their conflict. And in doing that, they heal a whole history of stuff and they're so successful in it and they they develop these strategies that not only work for them but work for other people so they decide to together to open a a kind of a um an out an outward bound uh place for troubled teens you know that kind of that kind of a program and uh while the teens are away on their wilderness adventure they, the, the two co-founders, Avi and Yusuf, work with the true source of the conflict, which are the parents. Uh, and they teach them about these mindset shifts that we'll be exploring in the next few weeks that uh, really help them to create peace and resolve conflict in their own families. And so through the story, you know, it's, it's the story, we're getting the story, but of course it's speaking to all of us. And so we are learning that there are the certain mindsets that we can all get trapped in that, um, that, that sort of um, invite, almost invite conflict. And then we learn strategies for creating, building uh, loving cooperative relationships that proactively resist conflict. Any of you ever experienced any conflict with anyone in your life? I'm guessing yes. I mean, it's just, we all do. It's, it seems to be a part of life. Some people seem to experience more conflict than others. And those people might tell you it's because they have to deal with a lot of difficult people. You see that there's, you know, they have to deal with difficult people in their work environment. They have to deal with difficult people in their families. You know, they have to deal with difficult people. But what we're learning here is that we all have the power within us to create peace in any moment, in any environment and in any relationship. And you know, it feels like there is conflict all around us, doesn't it? You know, there's conflict in business, there's conflict within organizations, there's conflict in politics, certainly. <laughs> we see that, you know, differing ideologies ripe with conflict. There's conflict between the cities and the rural areas, between states, there's conflict between countries. It's just everywhere, conflict is everywhere. And it feels like it's been with us from the very beginning of time. I mean, look at the Old Testament. But you know what else has been with us from the very beginning? Is a power within us to be able to open to the peace that is within us and to create that peace in our world. That's been with us from the very beginning. I mean, if we can connect with peace in our hearts and we can learn to create peace in our relationships, there's hope for us. You know, there's hope for our families. There's hope for our countries, there's hope for the world. 
So the story uh, is centered around, in the beginning, the story is centered around uh, this family. Lou is the father, uh, husband, and uh, his wife, Carol, and their son, Corey, who's in a lot of trouble. So uh, that's why they've come to um, this, uh, this Outward Bound program to enroll him in this. And we find out pretty early on that uh, Lou is an ex-Marine. He's uh, done a few tours uh, of duty in, um, in Vietnam. And uh, his behavior is kind of rough and he's, you know, he's demanding, opinionated, forceful kind of guy. That's kind of the, the, what we get from his behavior. And uh, then we find out a little bit later on that the company, he's created a company, but it's in serious trouble. His top executives are, it's like this mass exodus, right? He's losing all his best people mainly because of his behavior. And, um, but he doesn't know this, right? He doesn't recognize that. And so he's, uh, he's feeling some conflict. And on top of that, his son, Corey, has gotten into drugs. He's taking drugs, he's selling drugs, he's uh, stealing for drugs, and he's gotten caught. In fact, he's just been released from serving a prison sentence. And the interesting thing is that Corey is very different from his older siblings. Um, you know, they're all on this walk on the straight and narrow path. One is very smart. She's a student in MIT. Uh, another one is grown and a professional. And, and so the father, Lou, regards Corey as a, the, the huge disappointment in the family. As, as a huge disappointment. And Corey feels that, you see. And Lou has done everything he can to try to change Corey's behavior. He's, he's tried everything unsuccessfully. And in this interaction between Lou and the um, co-founder Yusuf, we learn that again, you know, it's the story in the book, but it's speaking to all of us. We learn that most of us are unsuccessful in trying to change other people when we try hard to change other people. I mean, think about it in your own life. Have you ever tried to change someone, someone's behavior, like maybe your child or a spouse or someone in your family, you try to reason with them, you dangle carrots, you, you uh, try sticks, you, you try all these manipulative tactics to try to get them to change. And ultimately how successful are you in that? <laughs> instead, Yusuf tells us that, it, it, you know, instead of trying to change other people, we must become an agent of change. We must become an agent of change. So he says, he says, I become an agent of change to the degree that I begin to live to help things go right, rather than simply to correct things that are going wrong. And that's a big point in this book, um, you know, that most of us spend way more time trying to fix things that are going wrong than we do, you know, actively helping things to go right. So think about that in your life. You know, how much time do you feel you spend trying to de dealing with or trying to fix things that are going wrong and how much time do you spend actively helping things to go right? And we can, we can change that, see? We can shift that. Because the more time that we spend actively trying to help things go right, the less time we're going to need to fix things that have gone wrong. And we do that. We become an agent of change by investing time 
into creating relationships, building relationships by listening, learning, relating to others as people, as individuals with hopes and dreams and fears and needs just like us, you know, as opposed to regarding others as objects, a troubled teen, a nagging spouse, a demanding boss, a lazy employee, a nosy neighbor, or those others, you know, those others, ooh, those Republicans, those Democrats, black people, white people, Hispanics. Our hearts are at war when we relate to others as objects, as categories that we paint with this broad brush stroke instead of individuals, people with hopes and dreams and fears and needs just like us. You know, our our hearts are at war when we relate to others as, when we think of others as obstacles to getting what we want. You can see that playing out pretty clearly uh, in our Congress. <laughs> it's a good example. But can you see that playing out in your life? Or our hearts are at war when we relate to people as vehicles for getting what we want or as maybe irrelevant when our, our hearts are at war there's no peace in our life you know there's there's no harmony and we have a more difficult time thinking clearly you know making clear-headed decisions but when we begin to see everyone as an individual, again, an individual with hopes, dreams, fears, needs, just like us, our hearts are at peace. So creating peace is more than, you know, it just, it goes deeper than, you know, trying to change our behavior. It's more about a way of being shifting a way of being, shifting our way of thinking, shifting our way of seeing. And when our hearts are at peace, there is harmony in our lives. There's harmony in our lives. And we give ourselves the best chance to uh, make clear-headed decisions, to think clearly. And also it says in the book uh, that it also gives us an advantage in negotiations. You think about it, you know, when we, um, when we understand or when we attempt to understand the other side's concerns and worries, and we consider them as much as we do our own, we connect. We can get agreement, right? So, you know, this book is targeted uh, to a secular audience. Um, in fact, uh, some corporations are actually using this program with their employees. Isn't that great news, <laughs> right? Wow. I mean, if you can create peace within corporate America, there really is hope. And so because it's written for that, it's written secular language. But you know, when you're reading it, you can see how they're saying the same things that we say in unity, they just use in different words. Um, actually, some of them are the same. This whole idea of a way of being, we talk about that here, right? That way of being. We talk about peace in our hearts, creating peace in our lives. And this idea of, re of relating to others as human beings, yes. And we, we kind of take it a little deeper because our goal is to see the divine in everyone, 
to see the divine, like the true meaning of namaste, the divine in me sees and honors the divine in you. That's, that's our goal, to see the divinity in each person, to look past the mistakes, to look past the, you know, different political leanings, different opinions, and to focus on that core of that person, the, the divine core within that person, within everyone, <laughs> which, okay, <laughs> not so easy to do, right? It's not always easy to do. It, this takes practice particularly when someone is behaving badly or they're an express they're expressing an opinion that is 180 degrees from yours it's not easy but if we can practice it if we can practice and just incorporate this a little bit more every day and build on this a little bit more every day which we're gonna be doing over the next five weeks. This is a series that is running over the next five weeks. So we'll have a chance to really explore these ideas, learn the strategies, begin to practice it together. And when we do, we'll begin to see that other people are responding to us in the way that we are regarding them. We'll notice people respond to us in the way that we are regarding them. It reminds me of that Goethe quote, treat others as, treat others as if they were what they should be and you help them become what they're capable of becoming. All right. That's how we become a positive influence. That's how we are an agent of true change. So I think one of the um, most clear examples of this, to see this in action. Um, and I've just, um, I've just run across this again recently. I just saw this again recently. Uh, it's that, that time in 1969, and this is on YouTube, and we're gonna show this in a minute, of, um, Fred Rogers, AKA Mr. Rogers. And he goes before uh, Congress in order to save the funding for public television. Public television uh, at that time was, uh, and many other times was on the chopping block. You know, uh, they it was threatened to be defunded. Some senators just didn't see the value in public educational programming. So they had a difficult time justifying the expenditure. Uh, so Fred comes before this Senator uh, Pastore, John Pastore was his name, who was known to have this rough demeanor and he's, you know, kind of no nonsense, hard hitting kind of guy. Um, but Fred does not approach him with uh, statistics or arguments to try to change him, to try to change his mind. And he doesn't see him as an object. He doesn't see him as a self-interested politician known for, you know, uh, a, a tough demeanor. He sees him, he regards him as a human being, as a divine being as somebody with a heart who deep down cares about children as much as he does. So we're gonna play this now and see what happens when he does that. You see, it was his way of being. It was his heart at peace and how he regarded that Senator that won him over. And this is something that he practiced. If you've ever seen a, uh, a documentary 
um, or the the movie that was starring, I think, Tom Hanks uh, in the last few years, you know that this is something he worked on. He was a very spiritual guy. He was very serious about his practice. He practiced this. It didn't not necessarily come, you know, uh, come naturally. He practiced it. He worked on it. So I hope you will practice these uh, uh, strategies with me over the next few weeks. And uh, we also have some book studies uh, lined up that you can uh, join. There's one in person on Sunday afternoon that I'm facilitating. And there is one on Friday morning via Zoom with Maria Kavanaugh, who will be um, uh, leading that one. She's our, our board president, actually very familiar with this work. So we hope to see you then. Namaste.